There are many different species in this universe. A vast plain teeming with life, and you are bound to find something fascinating. Many of them have written histories and oral traditions that tell you so much about who they are, what they believe, how they act, and so on and so forth. However, if you ever truly want to learn what any species in the universe is like at their best and their worst, then you need to learn about death. Not just the concept, although how a species interacts with and treats their dead is indeed a valuable insight into that species. It is how they interact with their incarnation of death that is far more illuminating. Every species in the universe has a different incarnation of death mostly unique to them. Some are monsters who slay all beings with reckless abandon. Others are but a shadow watching and waiting for your inevitable end. A few are ferrymen who take the souls of the dead into their realm. Most of these incarnations range from indifferent to malicious. Well, all of them minus one. Actually, only one does not fall in line with the rest. That one is, perhaps unsurprisingly, the incarnation of death that came with the humans. Just as humans are so unique and strange amongst the grand majority of the galaxy, so too is their death unique and strange amongst other incarnations. The interactions and differences between humanity's incarnation of death and the incarnations of other species are mirrored in many ways to the humans and their own relationships to other species. Humans are well known amongst the galaxies. A species that is simultaneously capable of inordinate kindness and horrific atrocities. They are by far one of the physically weakest species in the universe. And yet, they remain undefeated in the art of war. From them, we have been given the greatest of medicines. Chin. Diseases that would have once blown through and annihilated entire civilizations are naught but distant memories because of the humans' advancements in medicine. And yet, they hold the only known planetary system-destroying weapons in existence. Their secrets in medicine and technology are spread far and wide. Their secrets in weapons and destruction will never see the light of day in the wider universe. Humans are a species that will obliterate any resistance against them in a battle and the next day they are helping the survivors rebuild. You can attack their soldiers, officers, pilots, and other military personnel, and they will respond as any other species would. They will treat the attack as a skirmish in warfare and respond in kind. Attack a civilian, and they will deliver retribution upon your standing army a hundredfold, but they will strive to bring no harm to the innocent. Their grand design for the universe is a prosperous and peaceful intergalactic community that strives to build itself to be better than what came before. All of this highlights the paradox of the humans. They are a death world species who don't behave like any other death world species. Death worlders are known for war, destruction, and near inhospitable homes. The humans' homeworld certainly fits such a description. About 70% of their home planet's surface is covered in undrinkable water for humans. The land on that planet ranges from sweltering deserts to overgrown jungles to towering mountains. Humans live in all of these environments. They even have cities built at the base of active volcanoes. Their planet is home to many non-sentient species that could best be described as monsters. Despite them all, humans are at the top of their food chain. And yet, and yet they strive to ensure that none of those species go extinct. Animals that are endangered are protected. Creatures that would have no compunction about killing humans would be protected by the same humans. They will capture members of a dying species and place them in captivity just to ensure they have a safe environment to reproduce and not die out. When they joined the space-faring universe at large, they brought with them the same mentality. They spent years cataloging and protecting so many animals in the universe. Why does all this matter? 
What does this protection of life have to do with their incarnation of death? Everything. The humans are diametrically opposed to death in nearly everything they do. They deny death his rightful due for as long as they possibly can. Rumors have spread through the fringes of known space that humans are even researching methods of immortality, of ways to permanently deny death his dues. If it were any other species, their incarnation of death would have had a field day. They would be little more than grass being cut down before a blade, obliterated before they knew what had happened, if it were any other species. Not humans. Their death is different, kind, inordinately so, unnaturally so. Their death protects them, even from other deaths. The humans have even granted their death a name, Metis Mors, a name which I am told roughly translates to gentle death. Humans generally refer to him as Mors. Most incarnations of death appear as a terrifying spectre, a being depicted as a demon of the species garbed in darkness and evil. Mors shows himself as a recently dead human. Decay has yet to set into his skin, though there is no color or life left in his eyes. He can appear as one of the long dead, and he often does when in the presence of non-human entities. Though his form is simply that of a human skeleton garbed in a black cloak, usually he can be seen amongst the humans as a comforter, simply being with the recently departed, guiding them to the great beyond. He is gentle in his approach and kind in his temperament. He has even been known to offer some comfort to the dying before they go with him. And yet, much like the humans for whom he ferries, Mors is capable of great destruction. The Argoxlian's incarnation of death learned this firsthand. A number of humans and the Argoxlian ambassador bore witness to that event. That incarnation attempted to slay a squadron of human relief workers after the last galactic war. Its efforts were halted by Mors. The ambassador has never gone into the details about what she saw. She says Moores asked her not to. She only ever described things as a difference in power. The Argoxlian death was akin to the eruption of a failing warp drive. The only reason the ambassador and humans weren't killed was because of Moores. The power of the human's incarnation of death is greater than the force of a supernova several quintillions of times more powerful. All in all, I am grateful for the humans and their emergence onto the intergalactic stage. Their existence has brought Moors to us. In the millennia since we met humans, he has become the incarnation of death for a grand majority of species in the known universe. The many incarnations of death have vanished after encounters with humanity and Moors, I have come to believe that this universe could have no better death than he. What I have been allowed to witness today shows the truth of my words more than anything else. Every year, on the last day of their homeworld's planetary year, humanity hosts a celebration. They find a dead planet and set up a grand performance. A myriad of species from all walks of life show up to witness this event. Most are humans but there are still scores of other species in attendance. The only commonality is that the incarnation of death that serves them is Moors. My own species, the Varzin, are the most recent species to fall under Moors's purview. And this is our first time being invited to an event we had only heard about before. Many people come to work and cater this event. A grand majority of the workers come to clear away any detritus left on the dead planet. Ruins of old civilizations will be taken to museums and preserved, while anything else will be torn down and used in constructing this grand event. In total, they take nearly half a year to prepare the planet. Then come the decorators. They take the dead planet and transform it into a grand venue fit only for the most important of royalty. Vines, thorns, flowers, streamers, gravestones, pyres, you name it. 
and it could probably be found somewhere on the planet. Finally, comes the most important group for this event, the musicians, an orchestra, primarily of humans who have trained their whole lives for this event. They said it is a new orchestra every year. They choose the music to play for this ornate dead world, pieces of music more beautiful and moving than anything I have heard in my many long years in this universe. The whole of the dead planet would hear it. It is considered the highest of honors to be selected for this orchestra. I didn't understand what I had been invited to until the day of the event. The decor was reminiscent of a wedding. It did not take much wondering to determine what was going on. The orchestra began with their first piece, the only song that is always played at this event. At least, that is what we have been told. Dance Macabre a piece of music from a long time ago in human history, a piece of music about the meeting of life and death. And as if called by the music, Moors appeared as an immaculately dressed human skeleton. Throughout the duration of the song, humanity and I watched as the orchestra played and Moors infused the already dead planet with his power. Following him was a woman, gorgeous in every way, also human in appearance, but garbed as if in starlight itself, a complete opposite to Moore's in all ways but one. She was gentle, yet still powerful. Just like him, she joined Moore's on this dead planet and grabbed his outstretched hand with no hesitation. They danced together through every song that the orchestra played. Wherever she stepped, small flowers, Plants and animals would appear, only for them to vanish in the haze of death when Moors stepped in the same places. I didn't understand what I was seeing. An incarnation of life so in harmony with an incarnation of death simply should not be. And yet I had been invited to attend the celebration of the wedding between these two. Words simply cannot describe the beauty of what I saw that day only that I was allowed to join in the dance. But it wasn't just me. So many were dancing along, young and old, human and not, alive and dead. I could feel strength returning to my weary form. I was allowed to dance once more with my dearly departed. Just like the humans, their death is so different than others. No other death would dance with an incarnation of life, let alone marry one. I don't remember any other songs that played that day. I just know that they were beautiful, and I lost myself in the music, the dance, and the sights. It was as I danced with my own wife once more that I truly understood Moore's. He doesn't love the humans because of who they are. Rather, he loves them and other species because of what they represent. He loves life. He protects life and gives them easy passage to his realm. For her, he is unchanging while she is ever-changing. He is so kind because he wants to be the best for her. For while he never changes, so too does he not age. Unlike his bride, who always changes and continues to age, life bows to time, but time will bow to death. He protects life from other incarnations of death to allow his wife to have a long and happy existence. He takes all he can to his realm to preserve their memory and beauty. What is lost in life is forever remembered by death. He remembers. They dance every year to celebrate the cycle that they represent. For one day, he knows that he will have to come for her too, that life will cease and she will join him in his realm. He protects what he can, so that she is never lonely, and that even her death will be enjoyed by her. He preserves everything for her. He will even destroy for her. His power is so far beyond anything we could imagine. And he is still kind. He is still gentle. Even now he shows me such kindness by allowing me one extra day to write my last words. My time has come, and Moors will take me to a better tomorrow. I can't wait to join in the dance again. The last words of Grand Chancellor of the Intergalactic Federation, Fendoran Scarbrax. 12,578 AH, 
12,864 AH. He earned his rest. May he be at peace.